It's a great honour to welcome you today to the 2022 Queen's Annual Politics Lecture and to introduce to you our very distinguished speaker. The Queen's Annual Politics Lecture represents politics and international relations as a distinguished discipline at Queen's University Belfast, emerging into its own with the first chair in political science that was created in 1958 in what was then the Faculty of Economics. The lecture series uh, showcases cutting-edge research by world-leading scholars and practitioners whose expertise is widely disseminated and prominent in public discourses worldwide. In doing so, it highlights their groundbreaking research and global engagement for the benefit of Queen's students and staff, the wider Northern Irish community, and a global audience. The lecture is generously supported by the R.M. Jones Memorial Lecture Fund in memory of Robert Miller Jones, who was born in Belfast in 1863 and died in 1948. He was a student at the Royal Belfast Academical Institution, where he later served as principal, and here at Queen's, where he became a member of the first Senate. So in that context, I wish to introduce you to this year's lecturer. Desmond King is the Andrew Mellon Professor of American Government at the University of Oxford and a professorial fellow of Nuffield College, where he has worked since 1991. He's a graduate of Trinity College Dublin and holds a PhD in political science from Northwestern University. Professor King has been working on issues to do with racial inequality and politics in the US for several decades, and he's published a number of books on this topic including, among others, Separate and Unequal, African Americans and the US Federal Government with Oxford University Press in 1995, Making Americans, Immigration, Race and the Diverse Democracy with Harvard University Press in 2000, and A House Still Divided, uh, Still a House Divided, uh, with his longstanding collaborator Rogers M. Smith with the subtitle Race and Politics in Obama's America with Princeton University Press in 2011. His talk today draws on a new book with Smith entitled Protect or Repair, America's New Racial Politics. Professor King's research has been recognized by election to fellowships in several learned societies, including the American Philosophical Society. And as but one indication of the impact of his work here at Queens, his research on race in American politics has for nearly two decades informed and engaged our undergraduate students taking our school's introductory course in American politics. In 1903, the renowned African-American scholar W.E.B. Du Bois argued that, and I quote, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. Now in the 21st century, it is in America's still tormented relationship with that color line as evident in the politics of white identity and Black Lives Matter, that we find stark evidence of the relevance and urgency of Professor King's scholarship. And so it, it is with a great pleasure that I welcome to you Professor King to deliver his year's Queen's Annual Politics Lecture entitled Protect or Repair America's New Racial Politics. So, thank you, Professor thank you. King. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I can imagine you thinking, what, what's this old white guy know about race in America? So that's a question we'll come to later, but we'll start off and pretend I, I do. Thanks to uh, Stefan and uh, colleagues for the invitation and the opportunity. And I, uh, you already highlighted, but I should say this is, this is work with um, a longstanding colleague, uh, Roger Smith at the University of Pennsylvania, which we've been doing for uh, over two decades. So, um, I'll start here. Good, okay, so um, here are two quotes from uh, quite recently, within the last two years. Um, one from uh, uh, a school district superintendent, um, African-American woman, Andrea Kahn, Kane, sorry, um, who wrote, sent this to uh, all households in her school district and uh, a response by the chair of the school board. So what is happening to the politics of race in America? Uh, 
These starkly contrasting answers given by these two Maryland school officials, one a female African-American career educational administrator and the other a, a white male businessman and recurrent political candidate, the question, it's clear, divides Americans as much as ever in 2020 and 2022. Because of the furor created by Superintendent Kane's um, uh, letter, uh, she left her long administrative career uh, to become a, uh, an, an academic elsewhere, escaping what she experienced as a poisonous race-charged political climate in response to this. So it's a, very, it's a very typical, you may even have read about this case, it got quite a lot of publicity. Once, however, it did not seem it would always be like this in 2022. If we think an alert 40-year-old observer in 1980, anticipating possible future trends, might have chided the inadequate pace of change following landmark civil and voting rights laws in the 1960s, but such an observer in 1980 might have hoped with real confidence for improvements in economic and social justice and for a continuing erosion of racist discourse in public life. The previous four decades produced transformative advances, that is, the advances of the 60s and 70s, so why not anticipate continuing um, improvements? For critics of the pace of change, of course, the dog whistle communications like the Willie Horton trope in 1988, when supporters of Republican um, presidential nominee George H.W. Bush screened a convicted murderer and who was African-American to, to characterize uh, Bush's opponent, Michael Dukakis, as soft on crime, that image demonstrated an enduring calculated willingness to uh, incite via racist imagery, if more implicitly than in the past. But the eight-year Bill Clinton presidency in the 90s, popular, immensely popular with African-American voters, and above all, the election and then re-election of African-American Barack Obama to the White House between 2008 and then 2012, gave hope that American politics was changing, if still not a fast enough to many. Already wilted, this hope blew apart, even for many moderates of a racial background of all racial backgrounds, sorry, by the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson in Missouri in August 2014 and of George Floyd in Minneapolis uh, in May 2020. Each death came at the hands of police officers, punctuating many other murders of black people by white hands, official and unofficial, before those deaths and since. By, the, by now, the now, the now, my now 80-year-old observer would have a hard time being sanguine about what America's racial politics looked like 40, 40 years out from 1980. The burst of outrage after Brown's killing, which became the Black Lives Movement, flowered nationally and indeed globally as part of a broader movement for black lives in the wake of Floyd's death, even as this social movement faced internal divisions and declining white receptivity. Although the racial distortions of criminal justice and policing were hardly new, the ubiquity of social media recording America's racialized rawness in the context of the extraordinary expansion of the post-civil rights American incarceration system made the country's racial ills hard to ignore. In the polarized 21st century, American political climates, um, sorry, in the polarized 21st century, America's political climate stirred up in part by racial divisions. However, racial conservatives and racial liberals drew sharply different lessons, lessons from these controversies. Many shifted to the right and to the left from the racial policy positions that had predominated in American life over the previous half century. The fact that a pandemic could fall as disproportionately on America's communities of color, along with the film murders of Floyd and others, reinforced the growing belief amongst racial liberals that America needed not just integration into existing American institutions, but systemic change. Conservatives, in contrast, sounded alarms about growing radical threats, soon causing a hitherto uh, obscure academic debate over the law school proponents of critical race theory to balloon into a national fault line among many newly impassioned uh, controversies. Against the hopes for racial progress that Americans could still feel on the eve of the Reagan revolution, Four decades earlier, these clashes exposed the depth and, and endurance of the political mechanisms in America that impede any steady, linear advances in the nation's uh, racial conditions. 
Those mechanisms include the choices of American leaders to build support among some Americans by demonizing others, a pathology to which many democratic politics, policies, uh, polities, sorry, has always been and remains vulnerable. Both before and after the great, greatest previous domestic conflict in American history, the Civil War, the first Republican president proposed that Americans act, quote, with malice towards none, with charity for all. Amidst the turbulent social and political protest orchestrated to demand racial justice in the summer of 2020, President Donald Trump, running for re-election um, uh, amidst national health and economic crises in which he had, to which he had uh, remarkably few uh, direct policies, sounded a very different tone. He turned his 4th of July speech into, this is 2020, into a howling battle cry against all those calling for systemic change. And he said to, let me quote him, 1776 represented the culmination of thousands of years of Western civilization and the triumph of not only spirit but of wisdom, philosophy, and reason. And yet as we meet here tonight, there is a growing danger that threatens every blessing our ancestors fought so hard for, struggled they bled to secure. Our nation is witnessing a merciless campaign to wipe out our history, to uh, defame our heroes, erase our values, and indoctrinate our children. Angry mobs are trying to tear down statues of our founders, to, to face our most sacred memorials, and unleash a wave of violent crime in our cities. Many of these people have no idea why they're doing this, but some know exactly what they're doing. They think the American people are weak and soft and submissive, but know the American people are strong and proud, and they will not allow our country and all of its values, history, and culture to be taken from them. Um, and this was very much a, uh, a prognosis of the times. And, uh, just give you some images of from that period. We have uh, this is during the, the Trump presidency, the struggles of Baton Rouge. Uh, I'm sure you've seen this image many times. This, this lady is a teacher from Baltimore who went to Baton Rouge after a, uh, a race riot. Then the Ferguson, Missouri, in 2014, the militarization of the police, more of Ferguson, and then the Charlottesville uh, rally in 2017, where Heather Heyer was killed by a, uh, uh, a protester. Now, um, for us as social scientists and historians, and my, my history is going to be slightly crude on this basis, it's not that surprising. This, this, this story is, fits into the pattern of the American state from the beginning. And um, we argue, Smith, Smith and I have argued that the, we think about divisions between two, every key period in American history has had a, a fault line which has been uh, around racial uh, issues. And we uh, divided into these periods of the um, immediate founding of the American state when there was a struggle between those uh, who wanted enslavement versus abolitionists. Um, after the Civil War, the shift to a segregationist order, which again has pro and anti supporters. Then after the um, major civil rights legislation of the 1960s, we moved towards um, a, a colorblind conservative position where federal government should just not uh, interfere too directly in, in policies versus a much more liberal racist coalition who want targeted measures such as affirmative action and so forth. And we're, I'm going to argue today that we've gone into this new period since 2010 of, of protectionism versus reparations, that these are loose coalitions. So these. On each of these sides, we see uh, loose policy. We call them coalitions or orders, uh, and they, they are loosely formed groups who fall onto one of these two positions. One of the most significant changes is the role of partisan division in respect to this. So until um, the most recent period, Partisan polarization did not necessarily overlap with um, polarization on these two positions towards racial justice. But this is something that has, has changed. And as you know, there's uh, intense polarization in the, uh, in the US at the moment. In a bit more detail, just to um, give you these, these eras, um, what, we, what everyone that scholars now refer to as the white settler order with enslavers and anti-Native American forces versus religious forces and abolitionists. Then the enslavement that's embodied in the US Constitution creates a division between enslavers and abolitionists culminating in the Civil War and Reconstruction. We know much more, there's been some very important scholarship in the last decade about the 
extent to which enslavement was a, a really powerful motive for the way in which the Constitution was designed in the 1770s and the way in which it was, it was created. Um, al almost all the founding fathers were, were um, owners of slaves at that, at that period. And this is reflected in many key aspects of the political system. Uh, then the era of legal segregation with advocates of racial hierarchy challenged by the civil rights movement uh, reforms into, into the 1960s. Um, uh, held up by the Supreme Court from, eight, from the 1890s in a very famous case saying separate but equal was a constitutionally acceptable way to organize public institutions like courts and laws and so forth. Um, we, we, we then think that there's, as I was saying, where there was a move to the, what we call the civil rights era with divisions between advocates of activists, race conscious measures, and uh, individuals, uh, individualist um, colorblind sorts of policies. And now we're going into this new period, or we are in this new period, when there is a division between white protectionism and racial reparations um, in, in this period, which I'll I'll talk about a little bit now. Um, so why, why are we getting these turns? Why has it changed? If the principle of color blindness was protecting most, most um, or, or working for the interests of white Americans, why and how has this color blind policy alliance now transformed into a much more white protectionist one? The shifts in America's racial orders begin in the first two years of the Obama administration, when violent opposition to uh, the president and his policies began to um, gather momentum, including the overwhelmingly white Tea Party insurgency and the, the Donald Trump-led birther movement querying Obama's citizenship. Uh, a new and more probably latent group of white identity conscious voters depicted whites as increasingly victims of discrimination because Obama's America was excessively politically correct and focused on racial minorities. Um, a 2011 study found that while both black and white Americans believed anti-black bias had declined from the 1950s through to the 2000s, Many white people thought anti-white bias had been rising through those decades, eventually becoming more extensive in their eyes than anti-black bias. So that by 2017, another survey finds that 55% of whites held that, um, held that whites suffered discrimination in modern America. Though many of these believed racial minorities also suffered um, discrimination. Nonetheless, a majority of, um, of, of white respondents thought that they were experiencing discriminations. Those who, exp who viewed whites as discriminated against opposed not only race-conscious policies, but also facially neutral uh, policies that they saw as aimed chiefly at aiding non-whites, thereby victimizing um, those whites themselves. And th there's a lot of good scholarship on this, this rising white ethnic identity, particularly a book by uh, the political scientist Ashley Jardina called White uh, Identity Politics, reusing the American election study surveys and finding that this group has been in the electorate for some time. Popular, popular um, receptivity to this position was helped by three aspects of uh, the Trump campaign in 2016 and then the way in which he governed. Um, first, a more militant rhetoric that eschewed mention of, of colorblind principles and spoke often of protectionism. Then a strategy with an emphasis on the special victimization of Christians, on really white Christians, and a pursuit of uh, reversal of civil rights policies. Um, and I just show you these again, the violence, we have these, these disruptive years uh, in, in this period. Um, what we think happened by this period is that um, uh, we can look at these two continua on the different um, uh, sides of the alliances, the position of conservative racial policy spectrum, going from a sort of white supremacist through to um, colorblind and then expand the pool efforts, which refers to supporting certain sorts of programs targeted on a, um, uh, on a um, 
uh, on an individual basis, a racial basis, compared with the liberal racial policy spectrum and racial reparations, um, uh, going from self-help, Booker T. Washington, colorblind, race-conscious integration, to a much greater emphasis on s systemic injustice and the need for systemic reparations uh, in this era. Um, conservative politics have ranged from overt white supremacy to demands for strictly colorblind public policies to acceptance of mild forms of affirmative action, efforts to expand the pool of applications for employment, education, and contracts. Liberal positions have ranged from the calls for black self-help long advanced by Washington and his followers to pursuing integration through colorblind policies to race-conscious measures to achieve integration to, to contemporary calls for systemic transformation, which is labeled as, as we're going to label as uh, reparations, racial reparations. Um, I think Smith and I got, got we got some things, some, some big things have changed and we got some things wrong in, um, uh, in the earlier period. So the term white supremacy was, even two decades ago, was a very marginal idea, would not be used at all regularly in, in, in American politics, but it's uh, become much more uh, systematic and central and included in the political system uh, in a way which is surprising uh, to us. Um, and has come back in towards colorblind. Uh, on the other hand, the, there's been, uh, uh, on, on the side of liberal reformers, pro-civil rights uh, advocates, the, the scale of um, uh, inequalities and persistence of racial-based uh, inequalities, systemic reparations, uh, systemic um, uh, racism, uh, has become a much more accepted and promoted mission, position amongst um, uh, advocates, and this has led to the uh, to the cries for um, uh, a much fuller uh, response and policy response on that basis. Um, now, Trump had a lot of success in rolling back civil rights, and I, I'm not going to. I've got a couple of slides here, and I'll just give you the, the broad areas where where this period things have have really changed in the last six, six years. Um, greatly to do with the people he appointed, and to do with the um, uh, civil rights with the. Uh, people that he appointed in departments like the Department of Justice, um, uh, Civil Rights Department in the um, um, HUD, and above all, what he achieved with the Supreme Court, and the effects of which are just continuing to uh, filter through. But affirmative action has been uh, massively um, uh, diluted, and there's a case, as you probably know, there's a case before the Supreme Court, which they're going to be hearing in the next two weeks, concerning uh, affirmative action at Harvard in particular, but some other universities. And I, I think it's without doubt that the court, the, this Supreme Court is going to rule that um, any use of affirmative action or diversity measures is unconstitutional. Um, the Trump administration also reduced civil rights enforcement um, and re um, pared back on the capacity of the federal government to enforce measures. The, probably the most important is in education. So America's schools are now more racially segregated than they've been since the 1980s. So the, the, the um, sort of upward curve in desegregation and integration stopped at the end of the 1990s and has declined since then. And this has been supported by, by the court, which has moved away from uh, requiring schools to demonstrate that they're doing their best to integrate. Um, that's just one of several things in, in civil rights enforcement. But um, it's a federal system. If the federal doesn't, government doesn't inter, uh, enforce measures, then it's, it's not going to happen. Um, huge cultural conflicts around uh, diversity, equity, and um, uh, inclusion. Uh, I, you probably know about the 1776 commission that was set up. And also racial sensitivity training was, was banned and so forth. So, so a lot of conflicts there, and those are continuing. The, the whole, this battle over critical race theory, which I'll come back to in a minute, is, is a, a central division in US politics at the moment. Um, immigration, famously, uh, the Trump administration um, uh, spent a lot of time characterizing certain immigrants as highly undesirable, and these were done on fairly um, familiar uh, demographic terms. Um, uh, 
perhaps famously with his with the first point on these on these uh, uh, on this list. Um, lots of other things about immigration which have continued. Uh, policing is an area where, um, again, the administration, this, this administration of, of President Trump, pushed back on uh, earlier liberal measures being uh, taken by the um, uh, Obama administration. And the Obama administration didn't do as much as it might have wished to do. Uh, in this period. The most important of these is the, is the first item on this list. Um, the Justice Department can impose what are called consent decrees on uh, any police department in the United States, state, municipal, local, uh, and require it to uh, satisfy uh, certain conditions of equality and uh, integration. And uh, this, this was stopped. So the, after the murder of um, Michael Brown and Ferguson in Missouri. There was a massive investigation of the police department in Ferguson, uh, which by the Justice Department publishing a very interesting report, discovering how much they were relying on uh, fining people for their uh, for their incomes, how that was done, how that was done in a racially discriminatory way, uh, and the implications of this and so forth. And a set of recommendations were then to be enforced by the Justice Department. That 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 all ended in twenty. Um, uh, 2016, 2017, after the new administration came into place. Um, uh, lots of other things on this, which I won't bore you with, but a lot of, uh, lot of measures. Um, Anti-housing, anti, uh, anti-discrimination in housing was diluted uh, in these years as well uh, by, the, uh, by the Trump administration. Um, schools, uh, economic aid, and so forth. Uh, all these, all these periods, um, uh, all these areas of policy changed during this period. So what I'm trying to argue to you is that Americans are moving towards, or really have already arrived at, an era from a, an era in which a preponderance of conservatives favored colorblind policies and a preponderance of liberals favored race-targeted integration measures. To a, they've reached an elevated polarized environment with conservatives moving rightward ideologically to protectionisms and liberals moving left to reparations. Um, and this polarization, as I've said, matches on to partisan polarization. Uh, as many scholars, as political scholars such as Lily Mason show in her book, Radical American Partisanship. And it's expressed in the fact that, for instance, a majority of Republican candidates running in the midterms in three weeks' time, or two weeks' time, less than that, um, a majority of the Republican candidates running in the country for all levels of office, Congress, um, state, municipal, state attorney, and general, and so forth, uh, believe that the 2020 election was stolen. Um, out of, out of uh, uh, 500 candidates, 299 have denied or questioned the outcomes of the presidential election. 174 of these are running in safely Republican seats, so they're gonna be elected. Um, and another 51 are in, um, uh, on the ballot in tightly contested seats. And I'm sure you know quite a lot about this, you've heard about it, but that's quite a significant uh, percentage and a number and, uh, and a development. Even so, and perhaps surprisingly, our evidence shows, we've, and uh, Smith and I have done um, uh, many, many interviews with civil rights advocates groups on the, on the conservative uh, wing and the liberal wing, which is what I'm going to be drawing on. Uh, our evidence suggests it's still possible to discern some common ground, even amongst those more, most, more intensely polarized protectionist and reparationist policy uh, alliances. At least some whites seeking greater protection are willing to view some reparationist measures to African Americans as likely to help them achieve it, while others who embrace Principles of color blindness are willing to see some type of reparations as justified by violations of those principles. Many, many liberals are willing to accept color blind and even protectionist policies if they believe they will operate in practice to reduce racial inequalities. I'm using reparations in a, in a very uh, broad sense, and I'll talk a little bit about the content of it as we carry on, but it's not meant just to mean uh, uh, cash compensation. It's got a much bigger range of uh, options and that. Uh, 
So what has changed to produce these two new policy alliances, the Protectionist Alliance and the Reparations Alliance? Um, and I'm going to suggest that three things have happened that we need to pay attention to. There, are, there is a whole new group of, there's a whole new set of groups on both sides which didn't exist two decades ago, uh, which have played a really big role in articulating this position. There's been an influx of money on a scale that's unimaginable, um, just a stunning amount of money, um, uh, billions and billions of dollars to both sides of this, stimulated by different events. Uh, and then there's been the development of particular uh, ideas. Um, now, I have to say, Rogers and I didn't really expect to find all this. Uh, we, we're, we've formulated this argument now on the basis of it, but doing this research over the last um, 18 months, we, we've been really startled to discover the scale of this change. Um, and so if you're skeptical, that's great. We'll, we'll talk about it. But we are, we are also um, uh, surprised and think that there, are these two, that there are these movements out there which are really not fully understood yet. Um, and I, I, I underline that when I say alliances and coalitions, these are, these are loose groupings. We're not talking about massive political movements that are all know each other, but we are saying that there are two broad networks, and there have always been these two broad networks in the United States divided by, um, uh, by the question of racial equity uh, in the US. So let me talk first about uh, new groups, and then money, and then something about ideas. Um, so if I go to new groups on the protectionist side, um, yeah. Oh, so these are new protectionist groups. Sorry, I should say first. There's a everybody we interviewed uh, talks. Not everyone, but ninety percent of the people we talk to make a distinction between what they call the legacy groups and the new groups. And legacy groups are the groups that developed, for instance, in the 1980s or 70s, 80s to support the Reagan revolution, like the American Enterprise Institute or the uh, Manhattan Institute or uh, Heritage Foundation on the, on the, um, on the uh, uh, protectionist side, the white protectionist side. And on, amongst the uh, racial liberals, there's groups like the NAACP, Urban um, Defense League, and so forth, all those groups. And they're referred to rather patronizingly quite often by the new groups as, as legacy groups, the old ones who are in the room but aren't really having an influence. Uh, and particularly amongst um, uh, civil rights advocates post, post, post the Floyd killing, they, they would see these groups of having been meeting regularly with President Obama in the White House but not really having any influence, whereas there's a, and they have organized on the basis of trying to, to achieve this. So starting with the white protectionists, um, perhaps the most important is the American First Policy, it should be Institute, sorry, not Foundation. It's called the American First Policy Institute which is headed by, by uh, Brooke Rollins, who was a celebrated leader of the Texas Public Policy Foundation and then became director of Donald Trump's Domestic Policy Council. Uh, they raised over 20 million in 2021 and employ several hundred uh, workers. They, it consists, the institute consists of 20 centers and includes many former Trump officials such as Larry Kudlow and uh, Rick Perry as well as a lot of other conservative luminaries, uh, such as uh, Bobby Jandl, the former governor of Louisiana. Um, the API, the American uh, First, it's confusing. This term American First, of course, was used by Trump all the time. And so there are multiple things called America First, which have letters after. And most, many of them are part of a, sort of the, the wider movement. But it's, it's hard to keep up with all of them. The American First Policy Institute centers um, uh, decry the District of Columbia and corporate, global corporate elites, who they say in the name of free trade orthodoxy allowed markets and market efficiencies to be an overwhelming influence on policy decisions. Um, and they call for an end to economic policies that, that work for big business. The um, API Institute's Center for Homeland Security and Immigration is devoted to protecting the American people against unwanted immigrations by uh, prioritizing border security and the value of citizenship. 
Um, a common enemy for all of these uh, American first institutions is us, academic elites uh, and demagogues, as they call us on one side, who embrace identity politics, divisions and submissions instead of working to affirm and celebrate America. That's quotes from them. They propose to litigate to protect the American way of life against um, um, uh, various um, uh, bad influences. So like many older conservative organizations, the American First Policy Institute has not abandoned all commitments to colorblind policies, but it gives overwhelming emphasis to uh, protection against the dangers that a cultural agenda of critical race theory and identity politics uh, poses, they believe, and the transformation threatened by unauthorized uh, immigration into the US, quite often joined by some of them in, with the um, with the term great replacement. Um, though this protectionist agenda has not concerned, is not concerned to protect only white Americans, there can be no doubt that the way it approaches things like critical race theory and identity politics and affirmative action suggests that that's what they, where they see the threat. The African-American political scientist, Carol Swain, who's a very, very important scholar, she's now a distinguished research fellow at the Constitutional Studies at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, is among many conservatives who maintain strongly that it is now white American men who are most discriminated against in modern America. And Carol Swain is an African American, made a reputation in her first book called Black, Black, um, uh, Black Faces, White, uh, white uh, Voices, uh, Analysis of Congress, but she's become an extremely strong supporter of President Trump. Um, many other groups who also employ the American First label, um, such as the American First Works uh, group that I list here. That's a, um, uh, five, these are all charities. It's a 501c4, uh, which means that it can engage in partisan politics, whereas the 501c3s are, uh, are not allowed to because of their charitable status. Women for America First is another nonprofit organization funded by the Tea Party founder, uh, Amy Kremer. And she, uh, they used a lot of money to support Stop the Steal um, after the day of the after the day after the 2020 presidential election, and subsequently hosted the Save America rallies, and also gave substantial money towards the caravan that was brought into the caravan of people who was brought into Congress in, on, or to Washington on January the 6th, 2021. Um, uh, amongst those. There's also a very strong and important uh, group on the protection side who are um, uh, tied to Christian and evangelical groups, Christian nationalists, we call them. Um, and for many protectionist conservatives, the belief that they are engaged in a righteous cause, even if it includes rule breaking and acts of violence, stems from deep conviction that they are serving the higher law of God and combating what they see as massive sinfulness in modern America, including the killing of those they regard as unborn persons and the proliferation of illicit sexuality. A joint study by the Baptist Committee for Religious Liberty and the Freedom from Religious Foundation showed how Christian nationalists in particular uh, participated in and uh, supported the January 6th um, protests in, in, in Washington. Conservative religious groups obviously predate Trump's candidacy, and they were, in fact, mobilized very effectively by, by Reagan in the 1980s. Um, but, they're, but, they're, but they found a very quick link with, um, with President Trump. Almost all Christian nationalists want a conservative Supreme Court. They wanted the end of um, Roe versus Wade, which they've, um, they've got. And th to advance other conservative Christian priorities, such as religion access to school funding, an exemption from anti-discrimination law. Uh, when Trump did more than any previous Republican president to populate the court with Christian conservatives, white evangelical Protestants increased their vote for him from 77% in 2016 to 89% um, uh, in 2020. Um, and this is a group that has become very influential uh, in, the, in the movement. On the other side, turning to groups amongst the, um, uh, amongst the racial liberals and the, the, um, the 
uh, Racial Reparations Coalition, there has also been a massive proliferation of groups in this period. Um, the re this reconfiguration is partly in response to, to Trump and the, his efforts to roll back civil rights, but also because of pre-2016 discontents about the inadequate pace of civil rights reforms and the meager efforts to reduce racial income, wealth, health, and education inequalities, the enactment of voter suppressive law, suppression laws in many states, and the intensified ra racialization of criminal justice, the apparent ease with which civil rights could be pushed back. Two months before Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson in 2014, and Brown, of course, is just one of many cases, uh, Tanahasi Coates published what quickly became a widely discussed and influential article on, quote, the case for reparations in the Atlantic, and the New York Times 1619 project on America's origins uh, started uh, in this period. So these are right in the middle of the uh, Obama presidency, a part of it. Coates is, uh, you may have heard of him, a very famous African-American uh, journalist um, and writer uh, whose piece in the Atlantic was, uh, with the, whole, the whole issue of the Atlantic was a quite significant monthly magazine was devoted to this huge article by him uh, about the costs of segregation on housing and, and, and education in particular on African Americans. The 1619 project was started by Hannah Nicola Jones, um, uh, uh, an investigative journalist and historian, um, uh, arguing that 1619 is the year the first um, enslaved blacks arrived in America. And this is the origin of the American state and that colonists were uh, running from then on, and 1770s should be seen as a um, uh, consolidation of colonial settler or settler um, uh, power and authority rather than as the beginning of a, of a new democratic state. And the Trump Commission, which I listed earlier, the 1776 Commission, was set up explicitly to challenge this. Um, these two journal, uh, these two um, figures are now at Howard University in Washington, the traditional African American uh, college where, amongst others, the vice president went. And um, Hannah Nicola Jones was was offered a, a, a tenured position at the uh, University of North Carolina, which you may, you may not have heard of. And then the board objected to this. It's extraordinary own goal. This is an incredibly distinguished uh, writer and journalist. And she was being offered a, a position in the School of Journalism there. Um, um, and they went and she's gone to Howard uh, instead. So, I mean, it's kind of representative of what's going on. So we find from our interviews that the groups, office holders and reformers now advocating for proper civil rights reforms coalesce around what we're calling this reparations policy alliance. It's a deliberately broad label that means different things to different political actors, but one that conveys the growing radical scale and conflict of America's contemporary racial orders. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement is crucial to this. Uh, it's a partner to roughly 50 other groups in an umbrella organization called the Movement for Black Lives. In 2016, the Movement for Black Lives adapted and has since maintained a broad ranging platform that explicitly features reparations, along with demands for black self-determination, community control, rest restructuring the economy, and investment in healthcare, housing, and education. Um, so there's a capacious conception of reparations being developed by civil rights advocates, uh, we're suggesting in this period. Um, and receptivity to um, reparations has increased in many locations, quite, quite often unexpectedly so. In July 2020, the City Council of Asheville, North Carolina, a southern city that's 83% white, voted unanimously to apologize for the city's past complicity, complicity in slavery, and the council created a community reparations commission tasked to recommend funding to increase minority home ownership and to aid minority businesses. Apologies are all the fashion, of course, at the moment. I mean, Edinburgh apologized last month for its role in enslavement, and there's lots of them occurring in lots of places. It's, it's money on the table, which is probably more significant. Evanston in Illinois, where it's... As uh, Stefan pointed out, I was at Northwestern University, that's where it's located. It's very dramatically decided to create a new tax to fund housing and employment opportunities for its African-American residents. And we can talk more about that. And there are lots of initiatives like this going on um, uh, throughout, the, throughout the US. Higher education institutions 
have, have really delved into their past. Brown University, Princeton, Theological Seminary, uh, Georgetown University, Harvard have all acknowledged their complicity in, um, in enslavement and in earning money from enslavement and trying to find ways to, to deal with this. It's a big issue. Uh, Johns Hopkins thought they were off the hook because Johns Hopkins himself was a Quaker, and I speak as a Quaker, so uh, they thought that meant he wouldn't, own, uh, have, wouldn't have had uh, ens uh, enslaved people, but of course he did. Um, so the Jesuit Conference of Canada and the United States uh, is working with Georgetown University and has pledged $100 million towards a goal of providing $1 billion in reparations to the descendants of enslaved persons. So a lot of these uh, uh, activities are, are going, going on. Now, this table, sorry, I should explain. Um, uh, H.R. 40 refers to the House, House of Representatives bill, that was a bill into Congress, uh, to set up uh, a commission to investigate reparations. And uh, 40 is meant to refer to 40 acres and a mule, the promise that was um, uh, announced during the Civil War as something that would be going to formerly enslaved people. Um, and this has been, uh, H.R. 40 has been entered into the Congress every year since 1989 by uh, a Michigan um, Congress member called John Conyers, who's now gone, so Sheila Jackson is doing it. And for the first time, it got voted out of a committee uh, last year. Uh, it hasn't been voted on the floor yet, but this is the first time it's got anywhere. And there were hearings about it, and there was uh, this number of uh, 647 Groups that signed the um, uh, that signed in support of um, uh, of of uh, the reparations bill. This is a very modest bill. This is just to, just to create a commission to investigate what reparations might mean. So it's got none of the specifics about um, uh, how that might happen and so forth. Um, and um, I'm going to talk about some of these organisations, but a lot of these are are, are, are new organisations that have. Uh, come up in, as well as the legacy um, civil rights or, uh, organizations. Um, in 2000, uh, Dr. Ron Daniels, who's a long-standing uh, civil rights um, uh, theorist, um, or activist, sorry, uh, convened a massive conference in Atlanta called State of the Black World with 2,500 delegates, which led to the creation of the Institute for the Black World 21st Century. Um, this new advocacy organization was especially keen to connect and mobilize grassroots and community action oriented groups domestically and internationally in working for racial justice reforms on a range of issues, offering policy and analysis. Um, the probably the single biggest uh, impetus to this was the killing of George Floyd. Um, and everybody we interviewed mentions this uh, as, a, as, a, as a key moment. It's, it's probably like Emmett Till, the Emmett Till moment um, that we're back, we're back at. And um, this Institute for the Black World and the National uh, Conference for if, um, uh, the Advancement of uh, uh, Reparations began also in the 20, uh, 2000s. I think also there's a really, um, just see the time, sorry. I, there's also a really important international dimension to this. Um, as, you, as you may know, Britain is being sued by, the, by Caribbean countries at the moment for compensation. And when David Cameron went as prime minister, he was prime minister a long time before uh, the others. He, he refused to apologize in, in, um, in Jamaica because he saw that that would produce um, a potential uh, liability uh, about these issues. And the CARICOM uh, uh, agenda for reparations is one that has influenced deeply the Black Lives Move matters, um, Black Lives Matter movement in the, uh, in the United States. Um, okay, so have I lost this? No. Next slide. Ah, there we go. Okay, so um, I'm aware of time, so I'll, I'll try to be quick. This is our attempt to um, try to map these, these two alliances uh, in the following sense that we, uh, a graduate student who understands these things much more than we do, uh, uh, was able to scrape the uh, websites of, uh, we gave them hundreds of 
of um, civil um, of civil rights and anti civil rights organisations to see who they're communicating with, and whether there was indeed these sort of different patterns. Um, and what we found is, it's I hope it's visible on this. Um, you won't be able to read the names, but in fact there is a there is a very distinct sort of um, dichotomy between the two the two groups, the two networks, um, and there is also a lot of cross linkage between, there are some key um, groups on each side who are uh, organizing connections uh, between them. Um, secondly, about money, and then I'll say ideas, and then I'll, I'll, I'll get through to the end fairly quickly. I, just to reiterate, we, we, there is um, a vast amount of money going into these organizations, both, both protectionist and, and uh, reparations organizations. Um, the, you probably have heard of the Koch brothers, and they're just really the tip of the iceberg. Um, many of these groups have been empowered by changes to the tax laws in the United States, which, which are very favorable to nonprofit foundations in terms of a way to protect your money, but require money to be spent on non-political activities. And uh, Jane Mayer in her book, Dark Money, which is a brilliant, she often writes in The New Yorker, explains how this has produced the uh, surge in um, spending by conservatives on uh, political uh, activities uh, through educational uh, measures and others. Um, tax laws have fostered the creation of not only 501c3 organizations serving charitable purposes and to whom donations are tax deductible, but also the other sort of organization, 501c4s, which can serve social welfare purposes even though, even through partisan policy advocacy. Though they're not tax deductible, so they're slightly less attractive. However, these groups can conceal the identities of their donors who are helping them work for controversial political causes. And so their spending in particular has come to be referred to as, as political dark money. Uh, and, and this has just grown hugely. Uh, uh, in the in the U.S. and become extremely important to um, to politics. The Supreme Court gave it a decisive kick in 2010 in a case called uh, United Citizens versus the FEC, the Federal Election Commission, which basically ended camp the regulation of campaign money in, in the United States by allowing the fiction that a candidate has has his or her own publicly listed funding base, and then there can be a, a, a parallel one with no connection, where the donors are anonymous and the uh, spending is not regulated in any way. Um, I can't emphasize enough the importance of money in American politics. I'm sure this isn't a surprise to anybody, but it's just really, really crucial. Something like the Federalist Society, which was set up in the 70s, and uh, to which now I think all the Supreme Court, no, all the, the so the five, the six conservative Supreme Court justices all belong to, didn't exist 40 years ago, but has created a completely new culture for what are standards of acceptability amongst uh, law scholars. It created the whole area of, of law and economics uh, by giving huge amounts of money to, to universities to, uh, to, to uh, foster these positions. Um, I'll just single out one, one, one gift which I think is mind-boggling in its skies. So the Federalist Society was run by a guy called Leonard Leo, um, uh, who, who became very influential under the Trump administration and gave Trump the name of the people he was going to put onto the Supreme Court. And they, the three people that Trump nominated all came from this approved list. But Leo is, not, Leo is no longer working for a federal society. He has his own group called the Marble Freedom Trust, which is a 501c4. And um, three months ago, this received a gift of $1.6 billion, billion, uh, from somebody called Barry Side, a 90-year-old Chicago electronics executive who'd never given money to anything before, but decided to give this. And this is for money that could be used in any way he wants. Um, and to, to shape the law. And it's very clear he's talked already about supporting changing voting laws at the state level, um, anti-critical uh, race theory and so forth. So all those sorts of things. On the other side, on the reparations side, there's also been a, uh, a huge rise in, in gift giving, just a huge amount. Um, social media has clearly helped this um, and lots of spontaneous community-based organizations have um, uh, 
uh, found ways of uh, giving gifts to causes or to uh, institutions. We've actually interviewed some civil rights organizations which have stopped taking money because they, they're receiving so much um, since the Floyd killing that they, they're not able to process it all and there's just no shortage of funding there. One of the key actors in this is, um, that was the Color for Change, was the, that organization, which is a, which is a new group. Um, one of the key, key givers of money here is uh, the ex-Mrs. Uh, Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, Scott McKenzie Smith, or she's now Scott McKenzie. Uh, and she, she has so much money, it's just mind-boggling how much she has to give away um, because of the, the laws of our foundation. And she's been extremely generous and very good in supporting. Without her, some historically black universities and colleges would just have ceased. Um, she's, she gave... Um, so the data I have is she gave six billion away in 2020 and has given away uh, eight billion this year already uh, to 100 to 300 different organisations. And this kind of philanthropy has been is is I mean philanthropy has always been part of American politics. I know you're going to tell me, and money has always been part of it, and I entirely agree. But this is this is on a on a on a new scale. Um, the third thing is the. Uh, Okay, so oh, that, is that clearer? That's the same, same information on a slightly clearer basis. The ideas behind this, um, there are, uh, I mean, it sounds very scatty, like there are lots of different actors and it's not particularly coherent in some ways, and that's possibly part of the story, but there are also um, clear visions uh, emerging on these, on these two sides. And um, on the... Um, I'll just talk about these two. On, on the white protectionist side, there's a group now called the National Conservatism Conference. Um, and it's funded by, again, by uh, wealthy uh, uh, billionaires. This, this time, uh, Peter Thiel has been quite involved in funding it. And it's organized by the Edmund Burke Foundation and the Conservative Partnership Institute. Um, and they've argued for a, uh, a more uncompromising conservatism, and uh, they have an annual conference. It's, it was deliberately set up as a, as a, uh, um, uh, to, to move away from the Conservative Party Political Action Committee conference, which meets every, every year, to be more radical than that, um, to be tougher. And they've uh, disseminated um, an international statement of principles, Proclaim, we see a world of independent nations, each pursuing its own goals as the genuine alternative to universalist ideologies. Um, uh, the statement's fourth, fourth principle, controversially, is that the Bible should be read as the first among the sources of a shared Western civilization and schools and universities. And where a Christian majority exists, public life should be rooted in Christianity and its moral vision which should be honored by the state and other institutions, both public and private, though Jews and other religious minorities are to be protected in the observance of their own traditions. They're sort of developing a, multi, a conservative multiculturalism, a multi -conserv yeah, multicultural conservatism, which I'll say a bit more about. Um, th they condemn most universities as partisan and globalist in orientation and vehemently opposed to nationalist and conservative ideas. Um, it's an international movement, but it's got its focus particularly in the U.S., and the conferences that's held there have been uh, extremely important. Um, the final principle of the National Conservatism Statement uh, is that all men are created in the image of God, uh, so that no person, quote, no person's worth or loyalties can be judged by the shape of his features, the color of his skin, or the result of a lab test. The history of racialist ideology and oppression, its ongoing consequences, requires to emphasize this truth. So this is kind of a big embrace of colorblind policies and condemning, quote, the use of state and private institutions to discriminate and divide us against one another on the basis of, of race. Um, so these statements show that this national conservatism rejects a kind of crude white nationalism, even as they oppose private as well as public diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives as discriminatory and divisive. So it's a, it's a difficult position to hold. They appear broadly consistent with the sort of conservative multiculturalism um, 
now being championed by, by certain um, organisations such as the Manhattan Institute and the Claremont um, uh, Institute. Reparations images um, vision uh, have many different shapes and reparations is something that's been discussed in the United States since the 1850s and 1860s. So there's a, there's a lot of traditions, a lot of literatures. Um, I'll just mention two very quickly. One is this very important book by two African-American economists at Duke University, Darty and Mullen, called From Here to Equality, uh, uh, which is a, um, a really serious piece of academic research looking at the, the costs. It's a sort of a taut uh, approach to uh, reparations. And then the National African-American uh, Reparations Commission, which is a 10-point reparations plan, which is more expansive and wants to um, uh, include um, ag full acknowledgments of enslavement and to recognize contemporary systemic uh, inequalities. So the, probably the biggest debate among, for reparations is, is do you go for finding descendants of enslaved people, which, say, Georgetown University has tried to do, and there's uh, organizations which are influential saying that, or is it, is it a broader approach about about addressing the scale of systemic uh, inequalities in the US and, uh, and so forth. Let me finish, because it's five, sorry, I've gone on for so long. Um, just some speculation on, I won't go into these in details, on where, what might happen. I mean, you're probably thinking, you know, race isn't really that important to American elections. It's really about inflation and uh, policing and other issues like that. And that's, that's a fair argument. If you look, however, at what the Republican candidates are saying in these elections, uh, today in the New York Times, there's just an article with uh, a few of them talking about reparations and the dangers of this, and another one talking about great replacement theory. So I think it won't go away, and it's never really gone away uh, in American politics, so it, it will come back in some forms. But in terms of these two uh, alliances, where might it lead to? Um, I mean, I think we, we, we see these, this kind of descending order of of scenarios and possibilities, um, the most likely being an ascendancy of multicultural conservatism, because um, I may not have stressed enough, but from the 80s and 90s onwards, a colorblind position has succeeded, and the dilution of civil rights laws, the dilution of federal activism has been very significant. A second option is the class and race. I mean, there is a whole group of you know, important scholars, Adolf Reed and others, who argue don't talk about race. African-American scholars don't talk about race, talk about class. That's the, the basis for building uh, an alliance in the US. Um, but the statistical evidence is about disparate impacts and racial uh, biases, I think, makes that a very difficult position. Um, the hegemony of a, uh, um, of a white protectionist national conservatism of the sort I just mentioned associated with the National Conservatism Conference and ideas. Um, a turn to class center progressivism. I mean, this is the dream probably of Bernie Sanders, and that's, that's that, that sort of uh, wing of uh, the left wing of the Democratic Party and more radical groups, um, and, or a much more broadly intersectional reparations alliance uh, as a possibility, but um, that's probably not going to happen. I've gone on way too long, and, and uh, I'm sorry to uh, tried your patience, but thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you. Thank you.